According to the dictionary, a rebel is a term used to describe one who fights authority. Or it can be an act of defiance against a ruling power. It refers to the refusal to obey someone's wishes or commands. It is used for a person who resists any type of control, convention, or tradition. It's commonly used to indicate a person who refuses allegiance to, resists, or rises in arms against the ruler or government of their country. They're rebels. They're ones that are not staying in line, that are not remaining faithful subjects. You know, as parents, we're kind of aware of this concept, this idea of moments of defiance and resistance. And, and in fact, uh, as parents, uh, pretty much as our children start learning vocabulary, usually mama and dad, dad what, what's the third word that they, they learn? No, no, eat yourself, no, you know, and so that immediately comes out, and you're like, really? Uh, okay, and, and so we're, we're used to this, and that only escalates as you go into the teen years, you know, uh, during that time of development, the area called the prefrontal cortex begins developing, and this is the part of the brain that is kind of interesting, it, it's the part of the brain that, that forms ideas, and so you begin to start thinking abstractly. And you also develop the idea to think critically and to start to question others' ideas. And so teens magically start to see the flaws. Have you guys seen the flaws in your parents? Raise your hands. You're all, oh, really? Okay. A couple of honest ones up front. And so you start listening to what your parents say, their commands. And, and, and all the things that they're asking you to do is you start weighing these things and you go, well, you know what? I appreciate your input. I, I appreciate your ideas and I'll take that under consideration. But for the time being, I'm going to do my own thing. And so that's when friction comes in. When we have rebels that are going against the established government of the home. And so, well, what happens when you have an entire nation, we're going to see today, that has made the decision we're going to rebel against the covenant that we signed years ago. Well, it wasn't us. It was our forefathers. We didn't have any input on this. We're going to make a decision to rebel against the covenant that we are living under. So that's what we're going to see today. And so we're going to see what it looks like. But they're rebelling against the very God in heaven that has given them every one of their rich blessings. But for these people, it was still not enough. If you remember in our study of the book of Jeremiah, this is a very difficult time, and there's a lot of inter international upheaval that's taken place in the Middle East, as if that has ever changed. But you have Assyria, Egypt, and Babylon that are all kind of vying to be the lone superpower we, we talked about. And so when Assyria, who has gone in and has taken Israel captive by this time, begins to have some internal conflicts, and they become weakened, well, then Babylon takes advantage of that, and they go and attack them in, in their capital city of Nineveh. Well, Egypt doesn't want Babylon to get the upper hand, so they start sending troops with Pharaoh Necro up and, and to, to kind of head this off, and they are, are, are defeated at the Battle of Carchemish in 605 B.C. So then Babylon is now this lone power, and under Nebuchadnezzar, they realized they controlled the, all of the known world. And so they start heading south. Guess who's on their radar? Little old Judah. Well, King Jehoiakim over Judah realizes he's outnumbered. And so he agrees to be Babylon's vassal, meaning you're going to be the susan. You're the one that's in control. And so they're, they're basically paying for extortion. We'll, pro we'll provide some pr protection for you, some fire insurance, as you, you heard back in the mob days. So that's what's happening. And so they've got to, to pay this, this ransom, so to speak. In, in addition to the gold and silver that they've got to turn over from Judah's treasury, if you remember, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar says, well, I also want to pick out a few of your subjects to bring back with me. So he brings back the best and the brightest. Well, that's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and some others. Uh, that he's going to take and train uh, to be subjects within his court. 
So all this is being happened. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. So this is the first deportation that is, that's heading over there. Well, a few years later, Jehoiah Kim's son, Jehoiachin, kind of weird, uh, is now on the throne of Judah, and he decides, I'm not going to be like my father. I, I know he agreed to be a vassal, but I'm going to stop paying these, these payments. Well, Nebuchadnezzar summarily just joins some forces. He sends him into Judah. And so in 597 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar takes this young, arrogant king off the throne, and along with 10,000 of his subjects, they're taken over to exile into Babylon, where they join Daniel and, and the others from the first deportation. So you can just imagine as these folks are having to walk from Judah over to Babylon. And so as they walk into capital Syria, uh, the, the, the capital city there, they're, they're dispirited and they're dejected and they've been forced to march. And you can only imagine what's going through their mind as they're entering into this capital city. And they're looking up and seeing the magnificent structures. And they're seeing the temples of the gods. They're also seeing these tile relief images. And, and they're thinking to themselves, their gods must be more powerful than our God. Uh, otherwise, why are we here? Why wouldn't the Lord step in this time? Why wouldn't he come to our rescue? But among this group of exiles is a special young man. A young man that originally had been set apart for the priesthood. But God's about to give him a different calling. His name is Ezekiel. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Ezekiel. Psalms is is right in the center of your Bible. And you go over a few chapters. And you'll see Isaiah and Jeremiah. And then a little book called Lamentations. And then we've got Ezekiel. Ezekiel is where we're going to be studying today. I'm going to start reading in the first chapter, verses 2 and 3. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of exile of King Jehoiachin. And the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, son of Buzi, by the Kibar River in the land of the Babylonians. There the hand of the Lord was upon him. So the, the text tells us that the, the heavens were, were opened up during this calling. And Ezekiel sees this incredible vision. And what he sees is, is I, I think even the editors at the National Enquirer would say, this is just too outlandish for us. No one's going to believe what you're seeing. And so he sees kind of this, this fiery whirlwind that's coming in. And it's, it's coming up over the horizon. And he sees four separate creatures in this vision. And each of these creatures has like four faces to the head. There, there's an ox, and there's a lion, and there's an eagle face, and that of a man. So it's just kind of really bizarre. And so you, you've got these four creatures that are massive and are powerful coming up over the horizon. And either next to them or under them it is this uh, it, it's kind of a, a, some type of transportation. Deal. It's a wheel inside of a wheel. There used to be an old song we'd talk about that, the wheel inside of the wheel. And this thing can move in any direction that it wants to. It's kind of a first generation of the Segway scooter. I mean, this thing can just move all around. And so in, the, in this in, incredible vision that, that they've got, uh, it, it really is it's designed to dispel two myths. The, the first is that Yahweh is not as powerful as the gods that are worshipped here in Babylon. It, it's just not so, look at what I can create. This is how powerful that I am. And, and the second one was that Jehovah's power was localized there within Judah. That he was powerless beyond there. But if we see that how this wheel in the, in the middle of the wheel can move in any direction, we see that God can roll into any country. But he can also roll over anyone that's in his way. And so this is kind of this vision here. And after the, he sees this, uh, above all this craziness, is this bright man seated on the throne. And this is the Lord. He tells Ezekiel in chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to the nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. And I will send you to them. And you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or, or refuse to hear, uh, for their rebellious house, 
they will know that a prophet has been among them. And so Ezekiel has to be less than thrilled that he's been called to be a prophet. He knows what happens to prophets. I mean, he had heard about how Isaiah went and, and proclaimed what, what God was asking him to do to call the people back to the Lord, and they stuck him inside of a hollow tree trunk and rumor has it cut him in half. And, the, and he knows his contemporary, someone who's a little older than him, was the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah tried to preach the same lesson that God's asking to come back to the Lord. What they do? They dropped him in kind of an almost tied up cistern to where this poor prophet, and when they dropped him down, he started sinking into the mud, and they had to pull him up with a rope. Left him for dead. His eagle's like, I don't want that job. I don't want to be the one that's bringing that message. It's not popular. People are not going to be receptive to this. And the Lord says, you're absolutely right. They're not, they're not going to listen to you, but you've still got to preach this message. They've got to know that I have sent a prophet to be among them. So this is what, what's happening here. Well, Ezekiel goes off, and the text tells us for seven days. He goes, goes and sulks. He's weeping, but it's, it says he has an anger within his spirit. An anger that God has called him to do this. And in, in, in anger that, that this is his life's work. I didn't sign up for this. I wanted to be a priest. Wasn't that enough? No, I want you to go and I want you to be a prophet here. So he goes and he, and he sulks here and he, he's upset about this. So he, he's not too happy with his calling. And then in chapter 4, this is where Ezekiel... Well, it kind of gets a little odd. Well, as Scott kind of mentioned, he asked him to go do something. He said, uh, I want you to go and get a, a large clay tablet, okay, and go among your, your fellow exiles, and I want you to draw Jerusalem, okay, so people can see this. So as they come by, they're like, oh, that's Jerusalem. I remember that. He goes, then I want you to go do something. He said, I want you to go and I want you to get you some earthen material to make kind of some siege works here. Leanne loves me. I'll just go ahead and tell you that. All right, so we kind of, he says, I want you to kind of build up a ramp up next to the city walls. And as people come by, you can kind of keep adding a little dirt. Just kind of keep adding a little bit more and kind of build this huge ramp. Stack it up there. And so people are going to go, wait, that's Jerusalem, and you're building a siege ramp. What's a siege ramp? Well, what they would do is, these fortified cities, if they didn't want to uh, receive a lot of casualties in war by trying to storm the castle, so to speak, well, they would just kind of surround, and, uh, surround the city and not let anyone in. But then if, if that didn't work, then they would start building a ramp had the opportunity to go over next to the Dead Sea and see the one that is at Masada, this giant fortress outside of Jerusalem. And in 70 AD, where they came in and destroyed everything, they went out there and it took them two years to raise the elevation. If you remember down the South Parkway and the North Parkway, you remember the amount of dirt it took to bring in to raise up an elevation of about 25 feet. Well, this is close to 300 feet to get up to Masada. It's a huge ramp. It took them a long time. Lots of slave labor to get it. So he says, I'm, I want you to build all this so people are coming by and looking at this. And then he said, I want you to get you an iron frying pan and I want you to kind of lay down and kind of do this number to where your face is like that. He said, what this is going to signify is the Lord is watching all this, but he's not going to be there for you. He's going to allow this to happen. He's going to put this to where he can't see what's happening. And you can't get to him. He's not going to get to you. He is going to allow this to go forward if you do not turn, if you do not change. And he said, I, I want you to just basically lay there. Lay there in the marketplace for a long time. He goes, I, I want you to lay on your left side for 390 days. And then turn over on, on your other side, your right side, for 40 days. And this is going to signify the years that Israel and Judah's history that they lived in sin and rebellion. 
dating all the way back to the time after David, we turned the reins over to Solomon. That's where it began. We talked about that earlier in our, our study. But in between acts where he's doing all this, he goes, you've got to eat. Well, what, what do I get to eat? He goes, uh, I want you to take a little bit of water. You're going to sip on it throughout the day when you take breaks from, from doing this. And he said, I also want you to go and prepare some food. Just get you some, make you some little cakes over fire. And this fire is going to be uh, not with wood, but with cow manure. And he's, in reality, the Lord wanted him to use human excrement, but he's like, Lord, I, I got to draw a line somewhere. So, okay, you can use cow manure. So this is going to signify that as this is going on, <laughs> rations are going to be very thin and people are going to be starving to death. So you've got this prophet. He's laying down there. He's on just this diet of next to nothing. He's shriveling up, and he's serving as kind of this living diorama and, and showing this is what's coming. This is what's happening. This is what you have in store if you will not turn back to him. And through this, Ezekiel's making it very clear as to what's coming for those who won't change their ways. Jerusalem's about to fall, and an entire people group's lives are just hanging in the balance. You too are going to be surviving on just bread and water. So the Lord is seeking to get their attention. Hey, he's trying to get them to, to change their ways. He's trying to elicit a response, any response from his rebellious children. The people have already started to be led away and, and they're building these siege ramps and, and people are going to be starving in the streets. And what you, you start asking all this, why, Lord? Why are you so upset? Why are you doing this? People have already been taken off into captivity and this is happening. What are you so upset about? What do we need to change? What do you want to see different in your people? What are you upset about? And so we, we see in Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 7, the Lord warns Ezekiel, even if you preach to them, the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, or they are not willing to listen to me. Because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. Let's take a look at these one at a time. The hard forehead... My dad used to say I had a numb skull. So I, I guess that's, that's kind of similar. But the, the people weren't willing to listen to God. It, it was like they're getting this information, but they have got the frying pan and they're holding it up. And they're like, well, we, we don't want to listen to that. We, we don't want to hear about the old ways and the old past we saw in Jeremiah. And they're rebelling against God in, in, in their lack of knowledge. So this generation had forsaken the teachings of the Lord they didn't know what their grandparents knew about Scripture. They certainly weren't living it out. And they had no desire to follow up on this covenant document of the law. And so they, they loved the, the blessings of being God's people. They just didn't want to recognize the source of these blessings. To them, ignorance was bliss. And the whole idea is this, that if, if I don't know what the commands are, if, if I don't know what's in here, then... Somehow, I'm not held accountable to these things. And so, I, I really don't want to know because then I might be held liable for this. And so, they're, they're trying to, to evade things by doing this. So, even Ezekiel may have had some of this kind of rebellious spirit in him because in, in chapter 3, when he's receiving his calling, the first thing the Lord says is, okay, before I send you out, take the scrolls. He's like, okay. He goes, now, unwind them. Okay, he goes, now I want you to eat the scrolls. No, no, I mean, not metaphor. I want you to eat the scrolls. He goes, really? Yeah. He starts tearing it off and, yeah, go ahead and eat more, more. And he's like, but really, it's pretty good. Kind of tastes like honey. And so he, he's ingesting the word of the Lord. So I, it's kind of strange. But in, in reality, what he's asking him to do is, if you're going to go out and, and be a messenger and talk with my people, you can't do it if my word is not inside of you. By ingesting the very message that he's commissioned to bring to his fellow exiles, it, it becomes, as it was, it is part of his being, is who he is. He knows it backwards and forwards, 
inside and out. The Lord says, is that important? You know, for some, it's, it's not as much a lack of knowledge as it is an unwillingness to let go of tradition. You know, this is how we've always done things, and it's not going to change as long as, as I'm around. So we, we kind of rebel against new understandings and, and teachings and new ways of putting faith into practice. And so the whole idea of keeping things static and keeping things stable, it tips the scale over being faithful to what God's calling us to do. And for the Jews, they kind of bought into this idea that as long as we're, we're recognizing the, the high holy days, so to speak, as, as long as we're, we're going to the feast, as long as we're dragging in our sacrifice in hand, we're good. It doesn't matter how we live beyond that. We come in, we do our thing as is prescribed here, mark that off, and boom, we're, we're done. We're free to go after this, is, and we can live in any way that we want to. And with God's prophets coming in saying, no, God wants more, the people were sticking their fingers in their ears saying, la, 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 whoa, what's that I say? Whoa, oh, sorry, can't, can't hear you, Jeremiah. They didn't want to hear anything that was calling them to live in a way that was so foreign to them because they had grown accustomed to responding to God in the way that met their needs. The Lord shares with Ezekiel that his people are rebelling with their hard hearts. The, the second thing he warns them is, is, I mean, with a hard forehead. Now he's talking to him about stubborn hearts. A stubborn heart is people who resist opening themselves up to relationship with God. I, I know this kind of sounds strange, but they were preferred to keep God at kind of arm's length. I, I want to come to God on, on my terms and, and vice versa. I'll let God into certain parts of my life, but not all parts. And out of sight, it was really out of mind. And if I'm not like a genie in a bottle calling God up to a certain situation, I really don't want to think about him. I, want to, I don't want that relationship to get too complicated. He says, my people are not willing to listen to me. They're not willing to carry on a conversation with me. They're, they're not willing to draw near to me. And that's what I want for all the house of Israel. They have stubborn hearts. He goes, I, I want it like it was when we left Egypt. I want it like it was when they were going through their difficult times in the wilderness where, where I was leading the people. And I was coming to them each and every day and they would pick up the bread and say, thank you. Thank you for our daily bread. Thank you for the water coming from the rock. He said, I warned you when you went into the promised land that you'd forget me and now it's happened. But we, we have to remember the heart of the Mosaic Covenant because it was a very interesting document. It was a unique, uncompromising confession of total surrender to God. And basically it's saying, Yahweh, you're our God. Yahweh alone, we will love Yahweh our God with all of our hearts, with all of our being, with all of our spirit. Everything that's within us, we give over to God in exchange. He will love us. Vice versa, but God always loves us first. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 6. And with this pledge of this covenant came covenant blessings. It's laid out there in Scripture. You're going to have seasonal rains. You're going to have crops. You're going to have orchards and, and vineyards and herds and wives and, and children to help you bring in this, this crop. You're going to have abundant food. You're going to have security. You're going to have domestic calm. No wild animals will come in to, to threaten you. No foreign invaders. In fact, you'll have victory in battle and on the international front. People will respect you. You will have prosperity. All Yahweh wants in response is just allow him to be in their presence. But you know, if they're not willing to do this, the covenant also lays out what well, the covenant curses were. Pestilence, diseases, sickness among the people, drought, famine, military defeat and persecution, assault, destruction of property, being led off into captivity, slavery, all this they can expect. God said it, but before it even gets started, he said, when we sign on the bottom line, this is what's going to happen if you stray away from me, if you call other gods God. And so he's laid it out for him. 
And though Daniel and the others have already been led off into captivity, they still refused to open their stubborn hearts to God. They still wanted to keep him at, at bay. The people refused to believe that God would allow it to happen to them because this is Jerusalem. We are God's people. We're his chosen people. We're the insiders. We're the ones that have a corner on truth. We're not like the pagan nations around us. Certainly the Lord is not. This is just an idle threat. It's not going to happen. So they didn't want to believe it. Fifty times in the book of Ezekiel, the Lord repeats this phrase, then they will know that I am the Lord. They're, they're going to see through this dramatic action, so they're going to see I truly am God. I'm the powerful God that's over all the nations. It's not just my people that will know that, but we'll see in the coming chapters that all of the nations will recognize the power of the Lord. Fifty times he does this. Well, in addition to a hard head and a stubborn heart, the final rebellion comes from Ezekiel himself. It's the closed mouth. The Lord instructs Ezekiel that it's not enough to have an open mind and, and to be willing to accept truth from the Lord. And, and, you know, it's not enough to seek instructions. It's not enough to have a warm heart that's open to the love of the Lord and to have this relationship with Him. These had to be paired with lips that are open to witness to what God has done. Otherwise, it's just a vertical thing between you and God unless it goes out, unless it's allowed to be a vessel that spreads throughout the community. The Lord tells Ezekiel, I, I want you to be my watchman on the tower. A, a lifeguard, so to speak, watching and, and proclaiming and, and shouting danger that you can see from a distance. I want you to share exactly what you see and what I'm telling you. Ezekiel 3, verse 18 and 19 says, When I say to the wicked man, you will surely die. Listen to this. And you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways in order to save his life. That wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But, but if you do warn the wicked man, and he doesn't turn from his wickedness or from his evil ways, well, he's going to die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. This passage is one of the scariest texts. It's also the most comforting. Here, here's the comforting part. If we cast the seeds... If, if we're the sower and we share the gospel message, it's not incumbent upon us for that message to be received. Nothing has to grow up. No, nothing has to come of it. That's what the Lord, He's the one that tills the soil. There's different kinds of soil. We're just called to cast the seed. That's the comforting part. The scary part is we're held liable if we're in relationships with a spouse, with a co-worker, with a neighbor. People we come in contact all the time, but we hold back. and We don't cast a seed. We're held liable for that. We're not held liable for response, just sharing what God has done. People can decide for themselves if they're going to listen or not. After seven days of sulking and anger, the reluctant prophet goes before the people and he starts preaching these words that God had number one put into his head number two had worked his way into his heart into his heart and and finally was ready to flow from his lips you know there's a real danger sometimes when we start looking at some of these stories about God's chosen people from old and we start thinking why couldn't the Jews get it I mean, they had all this stuff going on. Why can't they see that God was serious about this? Uh, why can't they see the real danger? Why didn't they turn from their ways? But sometimes I, I think that we need to realize that there will be people that will look to us and say, why didn't we see what God was doing in our life? The message that he's got for us. What's God trying to get our attention about as long as we leave it in Ezekiel we're good it becomes a history lesson this is not a history lesson folks this is a message from the Lord from the prophet Ezekiel for our lives 
We've got to realize that. What if tomorrow morning you're driving to work at the arsenal and right before you get to the guardhouse at gate nine, I've got my clay tablet and I'm out there and I, I've got my little prophet uniform, you know, outfit on and I've got my dirt stacked up there and I've got my frying pan. And some of y'all are smiling because you know I just might do it, you know? What would I be warning? What would be the message that, that God's got for us today? What message would I be bringing? Number one, we've got to commit ourselves to study. You know, declare today that you're going to be a lifelong learner. Uh, far too often we, we go through periods of time of, of rapid growth and we kind of plateau. And there, there, there's even a myth that, that we can kind of stay where we are, where we are on the mountain, but in reality we begin to decline. And, I, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people preface their remarks with, I don't know very much about the Bible. And that's usually followed with, but here's what I think the churches should be doing. Or, I'm no theologian, but the stance our shepherds took was just wrong. You know, many folks seem completely comfortable operating out of a limited base of knowledge when it comes to matters of faith. Acts chapter 17, Paul and Silas are, are there in, in Thessalonica and the message and being received real well. And so some of the brothers said, your, your life's in danger. You guys need to go out so under, under cover of darkness. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 10, it says, as soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Bereans were a more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness examine the scriptures every day to see if what paul said was true it's the same message it's being cast it's being spread around but it's incumbent upon the listener to say i'm going to make an investment in this i i know what i'm hearing in class i know what i'm hearing here i know what i i see on the web and well i guess it's true maybe maybe not no, you've got to make that investment. You've got to determine, I'm going to be a lifelong learner. I'm going to invest in this. I'm not going to allow this to be a deficiency that my wife can kind of cover for me when we're trying to do family devotionals. No, this is something I have to make an investment in. You know, in Houston, there was a brother in our church who had a desire to work with our youth ministry and, and came to me not long after Jill and I started working there. And But every time I give him an opportunity, he kind of, politely declined when I asked him to do some things. Mike, would, would you mind doing the junior high boys this Wednesday night? Oh, oh, I, I, I'm a new Christian. I don't really feel comfortable teaching at, at this time. A few weeks later. Well, oh, okay, we're going to be breaking up into small groups. Do you mind taking just the eighth grade guys? Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a new Christian, and uh, well, they, they might ask me a question that's kind of out of, above my, my pay grade. You know, I, I better not. How about you just close us in prayer? Uh, say, say grace over the hot dogs. Can you get someone else? I'm a new Christian. Finally, I asked him. I said, Mike, how long have you been a Christian? 11 years. 11 years. What that means is he had been baptized. He said, Jesus is my Lord, but I'm not willing to be a disciple. Not yet. I'm just going to stay where I am and be content. Isn't it enough that I drive the, the car here and get my family out? No, it's not. God is calling us to make an investment, to be a lifelong learner. God's calling us to say, this is it. This is what drives everything else in my family, in my work, and how we operate. And I'm going to lead my family. I'm going to do it. I want to. I don't know where to start. How about this? We're doing this thing called cover to cover. Reading through the entire Bible in a year. If you're not on the email address, please call the office. We'll get it to you kind of a neat concept monday through friday we send out an email you don't even have to have a bible just click on it and you can choose to click on it and it will open up three chapters I actually timed myself this week averaged about nine minutes so you can choose to 
click on that and spend nine minutes in that. Or you can use your time with a coffee mug to get caught up on box scores. Find out what the latest entertainment buzz is. Or you can go and look at political block, whatever you want. It's your time. But I choose to allow the God, the universe, to shape me through spending time in dialogue with Him. And spending time in prayer after that. That's what God's calling us to do. So you can choose that or you can continue hitting delete every time. You don't want Adrian to know that you want to be taken off the list. You just have to keep hitting delete, moving it over to the trash bin. Because I'm not going to spend that nine minutes with God. If you're not going to a Bible class, get in one. If you're already in a Bible class, take your turn at teaching. You will grow tremendously. If you'll step up and do it, we're a very forgiving audience in every class. You'll learn so much more. It's so hard to grow if you become dependent on others feeding you. If you're not growing spiritually, you're spiritually atrophying. It's a lie that we stay where we are. If we're not growing closer to God, we're moving away from Him. The second thing that I'll tell you to do is to develop your relationship with God. You know, there's something in us that, that tells us to resist God when it's when, it, when his love when it's offered and you know there there's something in us that, that kind of gets backed up when, when love is offered and we, we, we rebel we, we, we kind of resist and you're some of you are thinking what are you talking about sometimes when people come and want to get close to us we resist because we don't want to be dependent we we don't want any strings attacked because people and our relationship with god sometimes it gets messy and i don't like messy I would rather be alone and doing it on my own than to have someone else dictating or, or dependent upon me and me depend upon them. I just don't want to do that. God calls us to stop the rebellion and develop a relationship with him. A stubborn heart resists letting Jesus and his church completely in. I, man, I'm just going to sit on the back row so I can slide in, slide out. All this small group stuff, ooh, forget that. Ooh, too touchy-feely, not going to do it. Don't want to go to Bible class. They might ask me to cook something or bring something, or, or they might call me to read. I, I just want God on my terms. Once a month, I'm just going to kind of I'm d- develop a relationship. There was a lady that I had a Bible, stuff, Bible study with several years ago. She lived in the worst neighborhood I've ever been in, East St. Louis. Those of you that are from the area, can see the city streets if you've ever been on them she asked me to come over and do a bible study i said i'd be happy to she said tell me the exact time you'll be there not five minutes before not five minutes after i said okay and so it turned out she had her teenage son that walked around the city block on either side and said there's going to be a guy coming in here uh leave his car alone and leave him alone he's a priest and so, you know, I'm getting out, and people are like, Father, and you know, I just kind of, in that neighborhood, I rolled with it and blessed the children and went inside, you know. I was scared to death. Met over a series of weeks, pre- presented the gospel message to her, started talking about how we grow in our faith as a, as a disciple and being part of the church family. She said, hold on. For her, she loved the, the thing about God and His love and forgiveness of sins and stuff. But she started taking a, a major step back. When she, I have to give myself over to the Lord. I have to allow Him to tell me how to live from this point forward. I just kind of want to get rid of some of the past and feel better about that. And I certainly don't buy into the idea that someone from my neighborhood with my background, the things that I've done, and my economic status is going to be accepted at your church. And so we, we stopped meeting. She just said, I don't know if I'm ready for this. And so we took off about a month. I got a phone call from Phyllis, and she called in a panic. She told me that two of her children had staph infection. She didn't know what to do. She didn't know who to turn to, and I was the only one that she thought to call. I said, Phyllis, stay where you are. We'll be there. And within a matter of hours, I assembled a team to go over to her apartment. We came in with masks and gloves and everything else. I said, Phyllis... Just go and, and pack your overnight bags for the kids, and we'll, we'll get you to the doctor's office in the morning, but you've got to get out of here where we come in and clean this environment because obviously it, it's infested here. And so she was quickly packing some things, and we went to work. She went into the, the restroom, and there was a young man that was down on his hands and knees, had the gloves on, the mask, the whole bit, 
and he was down there scrubbing the, the filthiest toilet that I've ever seen. And she's grabbing toothbrushes, and she says, who are you? Some janitor that they've hired to come in and clean this? He said, no, ma'am. He said, I'm a surgeon. I'm just here because of the love I have for Jesus Christ. And Phyllis just broke down. She cried that day. We got her over to her apartment or to her hotel that she stayed there for the rest of the week. In a couple weeks, she came to our church after the kids were better, and she was baptized, and her children, a few years later, were baptized as well. Her heart had been broken, and she was ready. Not only for a, a relationship with the Lord that she believed truly loved Him, but she was ready to reach out and to trust brothers and sisters in Christ that would come and do and serve for her like she did. And she said, I want to be a part of that community. Never had it in my life. That's what she's called to. Finally, we're, we're called to share our story. You know, the anatomy of rebellion comes to a climax when it comes to our, our, our speech. You know, the Scripture is it's very clear that believers are supposed to share what God has done for them. And, and, and sometimes we have that head knowledge, and we're not arguing with truth, and we've accepted that truth for our life. We just don't want to share that truth with others. And we, we start thinking, well, you know, some, I don't want to be too intrusive. I, I don't want to get too personal with others. And, and so we kind of buy into the lie that I'm okay, you're okay. This is the truth that works for me, and you may have a truth that works for you. We've got to get beyond that. We have to believe in a Heavenly Father that loves us so much, but a Heavenly Father that's holy and believes in sin. Because we've kind of bought into the idea of, of the world that we live and let live and just well, whatever happens. And we bought into the notion that everyone is more or less okay and not in need of salvation because we worship a loving God. He's so nice. Would he really send someone to hell? Would, would he? That's rebellion. Scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death and that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. We're called to share that gift. But I have to tell you that this is, <laughs> this is the part of our life that we're, all of us are guilty of rebellion. It's so hard. We have to make that confession. Our lives, our, our hearts, our homes, and our hearts, and, and our habits, everything about us has to be this living diorama where people see us. But it's more than just friendship evangelists. We have to say, we're going to share what Jesus Christ has done for us. You know, for now, we have to leave this ramp. I have to leave it up here. Because the people wouldn't listen to Ezekiel. They kept going, even though all the warnings were there. Jerusalem eventually fell. And the hardship and calamity that he told was going to happen, what happened? But we'll see next week, as, as Scott had alluded to, the Lord is going to redeem his people. He's ultimately going to bring them back to him. So where does that leave us? I'm just going to encourage you to really take the stock in your life. Where are you in your spiritual walk? I encourage you not to rebel. Resist, don't resist any longer. Soften the old forehead. Really think about what God's calling us to. Reread some passages that you've been told what they've meant for years. Go back and reread this study. Become a, a person who's well-versed, that you've committed yourselves to God. Man, I, I pray that we'll release a stubborn heart that has held us back for years, that has kept people at bay. And I, I pray that we'll also have open mouths that are willing to share just how good our Heavenly Father has been to us. But most of all, I implore you on behalf of Christ, Give your heart, your life, your everything to your Heavenly Father.